The Just Baseball Show is presented by BetMGM. Use promo code JustBaseball when you sign up and start betting with the king of sportsbooks. We're talking about teams that have kind of fell ass backwards into success when they might not have been expecting it in 2023. And how do you handle the next couple of months? Jack Aram for Tuesday, June 20th. Draymond Green turned down $27.5 million. I just brought this up before I hit the record button. That's crazy to me because like Draymond, yeah, really good at hosting a podcast. Was really good as a defense slash glue guy for the Warriors when they were winning. Is Draymond good anymore? Like, would you say yes to 275 He's one of those guys. Well, first of all, basketball money is the craziest of all money right yeah. now. I mean, it's on, but you can make 60 a year. Second right. of all, I'm still reeling from the fact that Bradley Beal is a Phoenix son because it, the nepotism basketball association, you can just trade, Easy. you can just trade a player to I, I get it mixed up is, is traded him to a son. The agent traded him to a son. Yeah. So, so the president of the Suns, the president and CEO of the Suns, his dad represents Brad Beal who had a full no trade clause and could basically force his way over, over to Phoenix. Yes. So that's really cool. But yeah, 17 and a half million for Draymond. Like I know he's not that good anymore, but man, it, it, he's also one of those guys that I feel like almost tricks you to a degree. He's so loud. He's so present on the defensive floor that he like, you, you feel like he's better than he is at this stage. It's almost the Jeter jump throw. It, the, the the Jeter jump throw, like, oh, wow, that looks so good. Like, it, he's been good for so long. Like, yeah, but that jump throw, like, that was a routine play for a younger guy that could have played short at this point. So it's kind of like that to me. Yeah, no, I, I hear that. Are you pissed that Beal is not a member of the Miami Heat? Or oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely sad about it. But yeah. um, it's all right. You know, I think the Dame, we, we, we shift the focus to Dame. Uh huh. The, the Heat fans, like, they're the closest thing, I think, of any Miami sport to, like, Yankees fans, where it's like, we're, we're entitled to every star player. We're going to get every star player. And I don't think they realize, like, they might not. They might yeah. not. So we'll see. But it's it, this is this is Marlins time in Miami. It's a baseball town now. It's totally a baseball town. We saw it in the World Baseball Classic, and, and we're seeing it with your 10-game uh, over 500 Miami Marlins, which is really exciting. The, the Marlins are in this conversation um, who else we got in this conversation? We're going to hit on Arizona at the tail end, but the San Francisco Giants are in this conversation as well. Yeah, I would say so. There, there's a, this is going to be, I think, one of the weirdest deadlines in a while. And I think that a lot of people are trying to, you know, I don't want to dive too deep into like hypothetical trades or anything of that stuff. We're going to save that for early July and the very end of June. But what should certain teams do? I think is really interesting because I do find this deadline to be bizarre that is looming in the respect that not a lot of teams are going to be selling. I talked about that early in the year, and I think it's you know coming even more to fruition here. And there's a lot of teams. Part of that reason is a lot of the teams that are typical sellers are overachieving right now. So we're going to talk about how the Marlins should handle things, how the Cincinnati Reds should handle things, even the Pittsburgh Pirates, how they should handle things. Um, and then the San Francisco Giants. Like These are all teams that are overperforming at least in, in the expectations department but there's not going to be that much of a buyer's market so I, i'm really interested to see how these teams approach it because you could make the argument for each of them as we go through it that they should be focusing on you know the long-term plan don't stray from the rebuild but you also can't put your hands up as you're three, four, five, 10 games over 500, depending on which team and say, yeah, we're good with this. We're not going to make our team better and we'll ride it out. That's not the move either for fans and for your team. So how do you weigh the present and the future? And I think all of these teams are candidates of, Hey, we're trying to balance the present and the future without compromising either. Yeah. And I think best example of this is Cincinnati right now, who is the talk of Major League Baseball winners of eight in a row. Cincinnati is now half a game out of the lead in a terrible NL Central, which is fascinating to me, like second worst division in baseball, only ahead of the AL Central. Um, but Cincinnati's 37 and 35 entering play on Monday Again, winners of eight in a row. Like, they're finding something when they were not expecting to find anything this year. They were probably looking at 2024 as the start of a glimpse of optimism. Yes. And now they've beaten the glimpse of optimism 
by a year. And they look like they can actually sneak in to the wild card situation. This is probably, if we were to scale all these teams where it's like focused on the present, focused on the future of the teams that we're going to talk about, this is the most future focused organization that we're going to talk about, but they're performing so well that it's hard to ignore that they have an opportunity this year. Big addition now with Joey Votto ending his rehab assignment, like his rehab assignment that pretty much took two and a half months. Votto is back. Votto is going to take over first base. Like, is that an improvement? I don't know. Joey Votto is really old. Joey Votto is really struggling. But how do you even begin to handle what a deadline looks like for the Cincinnati Reds? So it's funny. I, I, I will see if I take this back before um... – you know, before we get through, like once we get through all of the teams, I'll see if I maybe my perspective changes. But I think that the the Reds may have one of the easier decisions in terms of how to approach things, because I think you kind of set it up perfectly. You have a team here that is it would be ridiculous to point towards anything but next year and beyond that in terms of where this team's really headed. You look at how many rookies, how many youngsters are on the ball club. They're not going to do anything crazy, and they shouldn't. And I don't even think fans are expecting them to do anything crazy. They need to make an addition because this division is attainable. And I we got to give Peter credit. Yeah. Peter came on this podcast <laughs> and gave out, what, like plus 4,000 for them to make the playoffs, and we laughed. I, I laughed and said, I'm in. You laughed and were like, not even in. You thought it was like comical, which I don't blame you at all. Like, it's yeah. ridiculous. But here they are. There's still a level of me that has the same cynicism that you had, Jack, which is like, okay, they're playing really well. We're in mid-June. And they've rattled off eight in a row since we've even had this conversation. They're the Reds, bro. (laughs) They're the Reds. They're starting Brandon Williamson today. And I think he might get shellacked. I think he will get shellacked. It's actually one of the picks I gave out on on Peter's stream today as we record this. (laughs) They should add somebody. They should capture the excitement, the energy, and try to just slightly improve this team. But I really don't think that they should be doing anything other than trading a prospect that really is, you know, not that relevant to you, like a mid, a mid prospect, a 15 to 20 range in your system, and go get bring Michael Lorenzen back. Who, <laughs> Have him play the outfield. <laughs> he's nasty out there. Uh, bring a Michael Lorenzen back. Uh, go get a Trevor Williams. I, I would say something like that. I don't think that they should be doing much more beyond that. Um, I think it would be crazy to to push any chips further. Like you, Unless there's some crazy option available, Jack, like where you could take Noel V. Marte and – another prospect and go get a controllable arm. But I just don't imagine that's going to be out there this deadline. No, I don't think so. I'm looking at the starting rotation and like Lodolo's on the 60. You've got Green Rock and a four. Luke Weaver's at a six and a half in 57 innings. Like there's room for improvement here. You have to love Abbott and Green. Those are the two that are sticking here. Williamson is, I don't know how to view him because like obviously he had prospect intrigue and I don't know. Like I, I'm not high on him. Um, I know you're not high on him either. So y- you need starting pitching help. And I think you're going to need that down the road because you found what three guys that you truly rely on moving forward in green in Lodolo and in Abbott. Um, I think you're hoping that Ashcraft can really bounce back, but yeah, if, if you can find like a slight upgrade this year to the starting rotation, so you're not watching Ben Lively start, um lively's been fine he's been better than most of their guys honestly he's been better than weaver so like you're not watching six and a half era luke weaver start every fifth day if you can go find somebody that's a four guy instead of a six and a half guy um then go and do that but i don't think that you need to trade a a prospect that could be a big leaguer to add to a bullpen that already has alexis diaz and Ian Jabot, who looks pretty good and lucas sims who looks pretty good i don't think you need to go and get a high impact guy. I think we're two years away from the Cincinnati Reds going to trade for a high impact guy. Yeah. And and so I will say this, their system is, you know, got a lot more depth. So I think you can trade from one of the, the lower level flyers and go get somebody. 
I feel I feel a lot better about this team if if Trevor Williams is involved or Michael Lorenzen's involved. Here's the thing: you say a lot this, better. Do you really think a lot better, or like just somewhat? I feel. I guess it's relative. I feel a lot better because even if you plug in a four ERA guy, that you're removing like you're removing Luke Weaver. You're removing, you know, Williamson starts potentially or Weaver starts. So I, I'd feel better overall. They also are going to call up Christian Encarnacion Strand at some point, which is going to add some life to this to this offense. The reality is this team's only going to go as far as the guys that they already have are going to take them, specifically yeah. on the mound. Hunter Green, are they going to get elite Hunter Green or this like pretty good Hunter Green? Is Nick Lodolo going to come back healthy? Uh, MRIs came back clean, but he's still a little bit of t- a ways off. And then, you know, is Graham Ashcraft going to come back and look like the Graham Ashcraft he looked like through the first month or two? If that happens, they're in good shape because Abbott looks solid. You go add one more arm. You go, you know, you add in a bullpen arm as well. Their bullpen's been solid. Uh, Diaz is one of the best closers in the game. And then you've got a couple other guys that have stepped up. You bring somebody else up. I guess my last question on this team, because I think we agree, like you make a small between the margins move in the pitching department. I don't even think you really change the lineup. I think you bring up Christian Encarnacion Strand. I don't I don't see an area where you should make a legitimate change. I think you should catch Stevenson more and hope he catches fire and just works there yeah. and just go, you know, balls to the wall on the offensive side. Would you push prospects a bit quicker for this season? I think of a Connor Phillips who is decimating double A competition on the mound, striking out like 10 every start. He should be in triple A soon. And maybe you can, if he looks pretty good there, would you consider semi-aggressively pushing him to the big leagues? And would you do that with more guys or just maybe a Connor Phillips? And maybe that's a way that they can, you know, answer some questions. Yes. Just standout arms. I'm not pushing a single bat. Frankly, I don't think they need to change this lineup at all for the expectations this year. Cause like this lineup is really hot right now. Again, they've won eight games in a row. We're talking about them. Like they need to improve. Yeah. If they want to win the world series, they need to improve. But like, obviously this team wants to win the world series. Do we expect them to contend for a world series this year? Absolutely no. not. Absolutely not. But they could keep this fire going and catch, you know, a, win a bad division, frankly. So I wouldn't make a single change in the lineup. I wouldn't push a single offensive prospect. But if Connor Phillips is tearing up double A, if he tears it up for one more start, get him to triple. If he tears it up for two starts, three starts there, get him up, man. Yeah. And and I think, yeah, Christian Encarnacion Strand is the one guy you're promoting, and that's about it. And and that's internal. So I, I think external for starting pitching help, internal for more starting pitching help, and a teensy bit of offensive help. Yep. And that's all you got to do this year. Yeah. And just ride it out with the youngsters. Yep. Let's move here to uh, Pittsburgh. Same division, 34 and 36. They have lost six in a row, eight of their last 10. But they are two and a half games out of this division. They got swept in Milwaukee. It's a really interesting situation. I don't think the Pirates should buy right now. Um, no. I'm watching firsthand a ton of big league depth, get a bunch of reps in Indianapolis. I think they're good, man. If you're going to go get somebody again, starting pitching, but this starting pitching market, everybody wants it. Nobody's giving it out. Like you're getting Trevor Williams. If you want it, I don't think they need to do anything to be honest. No, that that makes no sense to them. And, And this is a team that I think is a little bit more in the overachieving department. I think they're going to be really good very soon. And they're, they're heading in the right direction. They're doing it in the right way. They bring up Henry Davis, their number one overall pick last year or two years ago. And it, th- that's that's the move. I think that's somebody that probably could have used a, another 50, 100 plate appearances in AAA if you wanted. But you saw him up close and personal. He looked great. I'd argue the bat is just about ready. He's going to play some corner outfield. He's going to catch a little bit. It's mostly about the bat. And that's what they're bringing him up to do. So maybe a little bit ahead of schedule, but – they feel like that helps the offense. I think that's about it. Maybe you bring up Andy a little bit later. You bring up some youngsters that maybe can make a difference. Maybe you call up Quinn Priester at the end of the year or or as you get closer, if you like what you see. I, I just don't think this is another team that's been working on a plan. Ben Charrington's done a really good job building the system, building some 
young talent. You've got guys that have really overachieved in terms of, or not even over, I would say guys that have hit their ceilings or look like they're heading in the right direction, like a Jack Sawinski, who looks really, really good. Really good. Uh, you've got the other pieces that look good. If anything, if I'm the Pirates, I this is a market where there's not going to be a lot of sellers. And I know they don't want to sell, sell. I'm not saying trade your your main pieces, but like, what are you going to do with a 43 year old Rich Hill? So that that was my thought exactly. Like, can you get a proximity arm? Can you get a double A starter for Rich Hill? Yes, I you can get you can get a solid, you know, I think mid level prospect for Rich Hill, especially in this market. If if you know, I think I really think a lot of teams are going to feel like they have leverage that because the only teams that are selling are going to be the Nationals, the Tigers, and the Royals, and maybe one or two others that you can highlight. If it's give up a slightly better prospect and a filler for Trevor Williams, or I can give up a slightly lesser prospect and that's it for Rich Hill. I'll just do that if I'm a team that's not trying to do too much. And I think Rich Hill, I mean, he's got a 4-3 ERA. He's still getting out 77 innings this year. That's a fine five for you uh, if you're a team that's trying to tread water and just needs another arm in the fold. He's a vet. He brings a lot of things to the table. There's no reason for them to keep him to try to make this miracle run uh, mm-hmm. You know, at the division. You could swap out Rich Hill. You could promote a young guy. Maybe he's not as good. It is what it is. I think that that's the no-brainer. If anything, I think the Pirates should actually trim a little bit. Chase McDermott, Orioles right-handed prospect for Rich Hill straight up. That work? No, overpay. Overpay. I wouldn't give up McDermott. Really? Mm-mm. Again, teams are going to be clamoring for starting pitchers. You I might mean, if they could do that, if they could pull that off, then it'd be malpractice not to do it. I mean, that would be an unbelievable trade to pull off if you're if you're the Pirates there. So if anybody near that range, I think it's great. Yeah, Chase right. McDermott, like best system in baseball. McDermott's like a top 15, 20. He's probably in the 15 to 20 range in that O's system. Where is he in most systems? Like in the 8 to 10 range? The way he's throwing now, yeah, probably. So that's yeah. why I think he's a little high. But, but the point stands. He, you could trade kind of any mid-level arm and, you know, they want get somebody like, that makes if, a difference for your team. If they're going to move pitching, they want pitching in return. So yeah. it's a proximity thing. Like yeah, the, the so. bats, there's a ton of offensive depth here. So, yeah, I, I find it to be a fascinating conversation. I'm with you. I don't think that they should – buy because i think that they have enough coming and again this is performing well ahead of the window much like cincinnati yeah and and like you don't have to trade carlos santana like you'd probably get a dsl lottery ticket that nobody even knows so you can keep him and ride it out but definitely i would move rich hill and maybe a bullpen arm or something one quick note on the henry davis thing henry davis is coming up we're talking before his big league debut he is one of three catchers on the roster now the corresponding move i don't know what the corresponding move is yet but Derek Shelton, the manager of the Pirates, did say that they are keeping Austin Hedges and Jason DeLay on the active roster. So there are three catchers on that roster. Davis is going to play right field for the Pittsburgh He's going to DH, I bet, too, a little bit. He's going to play right field. Yeah, you saw. You said he looked good out there. Um, yep. He played six games out there already and right away in AAA. So. A diving catch, has some great throws Crazy as well. Crazy arm. Crazy arm. Yeah, like he, he could be a corner outfielder and a catcher for the Pittsburgh Pirates. And, you know, like they could use some corner outfield help as well as behind the plate. So I, I think Davis is going to do a bunch of different things for them. And, and I'm excited to see how that call up works. But, yeah, I think the Pirates can, for the most part, stay in a holding pattern. We've got two teams that are a real postseason contenders that we're going to get to. And one of them is yours. But before that, quick conversation about So Rare. Be sure to join our league. Uh, in the episode description, the Just Baseball League and So Rare, chance to win Just Baseball merch, chance to win MLB TV packages. I am in the gutter right now. Like, Again? I'm no bueno. Again, dude, there's something about my ability in fantasy baseball, in So Rare, in like anything. Like, I watch a lot of ball. I talk a lot of ball. I think I know ball. But if I look for tangible evidence to prove that I know ball, I look like a fucking moron. <laughs> you just can't. It, it, it's tough with the so rare because you got to pick the right guys on the right days and and go from there. I came in 10th out of 142, which that's good. I, I'm kind of at least putting up a fight against our listeners. Uh, but I want to shout out for this past competition. We had M 
MS and 84 went off 258 points, which is crazy. I had 215. They came in first. Number two was zoo underscore two, five, three. They went off. They got 234 points. And then Jacob R five nineteen came in third with 231 points. They had Shane McClanahan on their ball club for me. 215.93 came in 10th. Uh, just balance across the board. I have Otani and he's just going crazy for me. Yeah. I, the, the last competition though, Tanner Clifton, who's a listener of our podcast. We shouted him out last time. He did so well in the free to enter competition. Um, I think he came in first for uh, our competition the other day uh, or like two, two competitions ago. Yeah. And he finished so high in the, I guess the, the so rare or like holy. Cause when you enter the just baseball league, it also puts you in the competition for the whole, you know, everybody for so rare. And he got a poor timing because he hasn't been great. Speaking of the Pirates, he got a limited Roanzi Contreras. So that's probably worth like 10, 15 bucks. He can use that to start his team or he can just sell it um, and, you know, just pocket it. But he finished so well that he got a limited card. So that's always pretty electric. That's awesome. Tanner is a great listener and he's a very active Twitter listener, which we really appreciate. So yes. if you guys want to chirp us on anything, hit us on Twitter. I'm telling you. Yeah. Like, it's very fun. We have a good time with that. So um, yeah, man. So again, so rare.com. The link is in our episode description to join our just baseball league. We've got a whole bunch of members in that just baseball. It's league. fun. It's fun. I'm excited. We got the new merch that we're, we're giving out to the winners. If you come in first, just DM me on Instagram or on, on Twitter, excuse me, and send me a, a screenshot of your team and we'll, we'll get your address and send you some merch. Perf. Uh, and we'll make sure to put your address out on Twitter. Make sure. Everybody- yes. Yeah. And Craigslist. Yes. Uh, also, send us your credit card number when you send us our <laughs> too. Cool. So just just in case. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> just for security purposes yes. or for breach of security purposes. <laughs> All right. Um, two teams, the Marlins and the Diamondbacks that we want to talk about. The Diamondbacks are like fully one of the best teams in baseball right now. So I want to yep. save them for last. They are cut from a different cloth. Yep. But the Marlins are also kind of cut from a different cloth right now than the Reds and the Pirates. Which and is... we got the Giants too. Oh, and the Giants. I totally forgot about the Giants. So we'll go Marlins, Giants, and then Diamondbacks. Bang. The Marlins are a really interesting conversation. The Marlins have won four in a row, seven to 10, I think 12 of 15. The NL East is catching fire right now. Miami's probably not going to catch the Atlanta Braves for the top of that division. They're five back. But Miami is currently a playoff team in the National League. And it's not outlandish, especially with a bad NL Central and a bad bottom half of the NL West, to think that the Miami Marlins can sneak into the postseason right now. I guess kicking it to you, level of belief in the Miami Marlins being a playoff team. Oh, I mean, man, um, are you yellow sign with the blue paint? Are you slapping it up top? What's going on? I don't know where I'm at on this team because I- I'm writing a piece up right now for those that are, you know, Marlins fans that listen to the podcast. I'm kind of writing a whole piece about what the Marlins should do. And it's already really long. So like the, the, the amount of time it would take for me to go through it all, we'd, we'd be here all day. There's yeah. a lot of wrinkles to this. But you're not going to find many competitive teams with the worst third base production in Major League Baseball. And they've got the worst third base production in Major League Baseball by a fair margin. Gene Segura hit the Phantom IL. You know, I don't know if he really has a a serious issue, but they said they said hamstring. I think it's just a time to kind of just work through things, take a break and try to get things right. Yeah. John Birdie's an upgrade there. So that helps. But to answer your question, they've been beating up on bad teams of late. But that's what you're supposed to do as a wild card team. They're 17 and 17 on the season against teams over 500. So, I mean, that's fine to me. If you're going to demolish bad teams, which they have, I think they're pretty much swept every every bad team they've played over the last month or so. And then hold your own against teams above 500. Like you're hanging in there. You'll get the Giants. The Giants are really good against teams over 500. Yeah. 22 and 16. That's what stands out to me. I was not a Giants believer this year. Before I dive into the Marlins specific situation, who do you think as a who are you buying more in terms of the performance? The 41 and 31 Marlins or the 39 and 32 Giants? That's so hard because I think you look at both of them like honestly, the narrative that we have painted just being, you know, friends and coworkers with you, like just shitting on the Marlins constantly, it's 
it's it's hard to take the 10 games over 500 seriously to be totally yeah. honest but i love what they're i love watching luisa rise i think brian de la cruz has turned a corner big time i love what some of those arms are doing and i love that they are 10 games over 500 when sandy looks like a shell of his former self yeah sounds like yuri perez is going to stay in the rotation right now for now and that's, that's what the Mitch big was saying yeah that's the big wrinkle here so first of all i did a dive into sandy yesterday and that's another piece i'm gonna write Okay. I'm not that concerned yet still. Like, so if you're not that concerned, I guess I'm placing more validity in the Marlins thing because I feel good enough about their offense to have Sandy and Yuri and whoever the hell else is out there. Like the bullpen is objectively good right now. Yeah, it is. I, I'm more concerned about the rest of the rotation because – you got Jesus Zardo looked much better against the the Nationals, and you know, he's been a little bit up and down. Edward Cabrera just had a shoulder impingement. That's been the name of his, you know, the story of his career. I, I I think you might not even see him again this year. They say 15 day IL. Like we might see him, he might not be the same. Like we'll see. I I'm I'm nervous about that. So you have Yuri on an innings limit. You have Sandy Alcantara, who I I still think is going to get settled in. You look at all of the back end advanced numbers, all of those things. It all looks fine. I really think it's just a execution and and location on times. Uh, Braxton Garrett's been phenomenal. And then you, that's it, right? So you've got really four starters. One's on an innings limit and one's trying to work through something. And then Brian Hoeing, like is going to fill in now and make starts. Your young guys are are banged up. It's it's Johnny Cueto was throwing 87 in double a. I pulled that. I pulled the data. It, he is unusable. He was, he was horrible in double a. He looks brutal. So I, I don't think he's even a, a remote option. They are gonna they might wheel him out there because they're paying him eight mil, but I don't think he's a, a, a remote option for this team as a starter. So all of a sudden, the pitching surplus, which is what we always talked about, pitching surplus with the Marlins trade from the surplus, they don't have it. Jake Eater just coming back. That's their trade chip. Max Meyer is hoping to be back by the end of the year, which is crazy. Yeah. And then Dax Fulton's out for the season with an elbow issue. So even their upper minor league depth is thin. They don't even have a full rotation right now. And they, I, for me, no brainer. You got to upgrade catcher and third base. Yep. Third base is the worst of imaginable. So you could go get anybody and you're upgrading at third. And then catcher, it's kind of the same thing. Fortez has been better. Stallings is, is I think, one of the worst catchers in Major League Baseball. He's got a sub 500 OPS, right? Stallings. Yeah. yeah. I think by a fair margin. So I guess my question is this. You're going to get Jazz Chisholm back, and that's the other thing. They're doing this without Jazz as well, which I think is an important wrinkle. Yeah. And he should be back in the coming weeks. The Marlins don't have that many assets. No. Their best arms are hurt. They've got some guys at the lower level. No one's going to want their recent draft picks. Their best asset's probably Jake Eater slash Max Meyer and the comp pick that they own at number 34, which they traded a comp pick recently for relievers a couple years ago, and it didn't really go well. That compact ended up being Judd Fabian for the Orioles. Yeah. Are you depleting an already depleted system to try to strengthen this ball club? That That's the question for me. I think the answer kind of has to be yes, because you're Kim Ang, you're trying to, you know, extend your job here. Apparently, as far as we know, you know, our contract might be up after this year. The Marlins have never been this good. Like they haven't had a record this good at this stage of the season since 1997. Are are you trading from you know whatever you have? Are you scrapping something together and or trading your number 34 pick in this draft to go get somebody to help you in in a in a market that's going to be thin? So it's a really hard question to answer for the love of God, please extend Kim Ang. Kim Ang has proven that she's a good general manager. I agree. Um, and, and you mentioned it on the call up, like you're going to be a hundred percent sold if she does a good job in this draft coming up. Um, yeah. But like, dude, I mean, I, I think she's, she has proven that she deserves a little bit more slack. Now I, I think yeah. a little bit more creative freedom. Yeah. I guess I am willing to move an asset to, to do this, especially in the position that she's in. Like if this is her last chance to prove that she deserves the keys to the Corvette, like, I guess you make that move. But if you look greater than the GM's job security, which I mean, GM's listen, if I was a big league GM, I wouldn't be looking much farther than my job security. I want to keep yeah, my job. Of course. I want to win games. 
I think that she may be willing to move it in that regard. Um, and you may have to, you're right, with with the pitching surplus turning into a pitching deficit. When does it turn back into a surplus? End of next year? Like next year's deadline when everybody's healthy? But even then. Even then, I mean, you're hoping that means Max Meyer looks like Max Meyer when he comes back. That's Jake Eater, hopefully looking like Jake Eater. That's Dax Fulton, hopefully being Dax Fulton. And then Yuri, <laughs> Yuri not, yeah, oh, forget that. <laughs> and then, and then Yuri not being on an, on much of an innings limit, which it could be, it could be there. That that could be a thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I'm trying to make a move here. If I'm the Marlins, you're trying to, to revive baseball in Florida. I think this is a situation where it's even deeper. Like you're trying to revive baseball in Miami. Yeah, you do that by getting somebody that gets people excited. I don't think they're going to be able to do that though. But even then, how much better do you feel about this team if if Jimer Candelario is is playing third? Instead I of feel Jesus? better about it. How do how do you feel if they went and grabbed because Candelario is not going to Candelario is probably that comp pick, right? That's the return. God, that would stink because you're giving up the 34th overall pick in the draft for for a rental a couple months of of Candelario. That's a tough part. But the thing is, is someone will probably beat that off. Like someone will make a good offer. There's going to be a dozen plus teams that want Condolario. He's yeah. a rental and he's a bat and he's an upgrade and everybody wants a little bit of an offensive upgrade. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I'd, I'd be willing to give up the 34th pick. Given the way the Marlins draft, <laughs> I wouldn't you know lose sleep over it. But I just feel like you can't give up that pick for for, for a rental. So, you know, maybe they, they're able to put together a couple of mid-level prospects and get him. I think they could because he's a rental and he's not, you know, incredible. Mm -hmm. But that's about it. I don't, I don't, I think the Marlins have to find a way to try to piece together a package from lower level guys. But I, I do think that this is a team that has to add. And I'm not saying that because I'm, a, I root for the Marlins, I'm saying it because Solaire is going to be probably a free agent after this year. Um, you don't know if you're going to get this kind of lightning in a bottle next year and you want to, generate some excitement around your ball club as you're trying to put butts in seats in one of the least attended stadiums in, in baseball. So I think you go out and, and try to get a third baseman, go get a catcher, nothing that breaks the bank. Um, you know, if you get Jan Gomes and, and Jammer Condelario, look, are they, are they, are they the best team in baseball? Not even close, but if Sandy pitches the way Sandy can pitch and you just plugged two of your biggest leaks, maybe they can keep this going. I think they can. And I wish I could come to you with solutions. Like I wish I could come to you with a creative third base option here. I, I just don't know if I can. Um, like I'll throw you Yasmani Grandal again. Does that interest you whatsoever? Cause that's, that's a DSL guy like that. That's yeah, that's literally a DSL guy. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's better than nothing. It's better than nothing, but that's is it an better than, is it better than Fortes? I don't know if it's better than Fortes. It's better than Stallings. You split with that. So, I mean, Fortes can't catch every day. Grand yeah. and DH. Yeah. Ugh. It's just a weird, it's a weird spot. It's bad. Grandel's Cuban. Like, could that have any play in it? <laughs> yeah. I think he went to high school. I think down there. He, he, went, he went to Miami. To Miami. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess <laughs> it's, just, it's just like, it's, you tough. know, who could, you know, who could be like actually interesting is Zach Collins, another Miami guy that jumps to my mind. Zach Collins was hitting the shit out of the ball for Columbus. Yeah, uh, AAA for the Guardians and and Collins like he's not the guy for the Guardians. Naylor was the call up. Zach Collins at this point has an 897 OPS in 66 games. Yeah, in I think that I could I could see them taking a flyer like that, or again like a Jan Gomes type or a Tom Murphy from the Mariners. Again, this is another team though. I think you're you're going small. If there's something out there, all of a sudden, then yeah, you put together your comp pick. You try to throw Eater in there, and you you give up some guys you recently drafted high and try to put something together. But there's another team that I think they got to kind of ride it out with what they've got and just plug the two like gaping holes, which is third base and catcher. I found my guy. I Can you text Kim Ang for me and tell her Zach Collins? Like I just had an epiphany. <laughs> he might come up and just strike out 45% of the time. I know, but, th but that's the guy. Okay. What's he going to cost? Nothing. 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 Yeah. I mean, they could stash them in triple a for a little bit, even I mean, they, they have no catcher in triple a just do it. <laughs> <laughs> Love of God. Okay. Uh, San Francisco here. San Francisco is, is a very, very hot ball club right now. San Francisco has won seven in a row, eight to 10. They're three and a half back of Arizona for the lead. They're a half game over the Dodgers. San Francisco is a team that won 107 games in 2021. And last year you, you, you were 
pounding the pavement telling Peter and I like this team is not that good and then they turned out to be not that good so you were spot on there again the San Francisco Giants are outperforming expectations that we had for them much like in 21 they're not the best team in baseball like they were in 21 but they're a team that is currently in the wild card chase right now and, and could be in the chase for a division depending how the rest of it shakes out how valid is their contention for a playoff spot you know, you know, I'm a big Giants doubter. I, I think it's valid. I really do. Because you look at this team. It's a wonderful balance of youth and veteran bats and veteran bats that are kind of having career renaissance. Mm-hmm. You have Conforto having a renaissance in his own way. You have J.D. Davis playing the best baseball of his career on both sides. You have Jaskremski bouncing back and looking solid. And, and even like Brandon Crawford will take a lost cause early in the year. And I'm not saying he's, he's great, but he's usable and he's been still a good defender and he's been a contributing piece. And I think a good combination with, with Casey Schmidt that you can kind of, you know, use both of those guys, move Schmidt to third, have him spot start at short against the lefty. Like they, they can mix and match the way that they mix and mixed and matched really successfully in the past. And then Jock Peterson's been Jock Peterson. Lamont Wade has had that bounce back. I'm buying all of that. And then that's not even to mention Tyro Estrada, who's going to be an all-star yeah. You know, yeah, playing out of his mind and having this like, you know, breakout at 27. Yeah. The pitching is a question for me. I think the bullpen's good. It, Logan Webb is, you know, the trustworthy guy. I, I, I'm definitely nervous about the rest of the starting pitching, but this is a team that should be adding because they don't have that many financial obligations. They have young guys. And we know that they're going to spend big in the next year or two. We, they tried to spend big this offseason. So why not trade a little bit from the farm system? I, this might be a team that could, if any, be as aggressive as anybody. Because even if they go out and trade for somebody and give up some assets, if it's a guy with some control, even two years of control, one year beyond this one, yeah, they can feel fine about that because you know they're going to spend in free agency this offseason. Yeah. So I think as long as it's somebody that's not a rental, because this team already has too many rentals. Jock's a rental, technically. Uh, Conforto's a rental, technically. I, I don't know how much more control Yaskramski has. Uh, Davis is a free agent after next year. Like They have a lot of guys that are kind of shorter shelf life. I, I, Crawford's also, I think, done after this year. Yep. What, what do you think? I don't know. I, you mentioned the starting pitching, and I just feel like we're – beating a drum that like is constantly being beaded for every single team in baseball right now. Every contender needs back end rotational help. And like there, there's not enough fours on shitty teams to help the San Francisco giants and the Miami Marlins and the Cincinnati reds. Like there's, I don't know. It's so hard yeah. here because right now they're running out Logan Webb. Good. D Sclafani. Okay. Alex Wood. Okay. Sean Manaya brutal a 5-8 yeah. and then it's a bullpen day sucks that it's strain city i was looking forward to more Cobb. i was looking forward to more stripling we haven't gotten stripling in a month Cobb just went down with an oblique last week like it's we're at that point of the baseball season where i would love to see the giants at full health so i can properly assess yeah you can't properly assess right now with flores with a foot contusion and Hanniger being out with that fractured forearm. Now, I love that Luis Matos is getting a shot. 17 plate appearances. No punchies, man. Five walks, no Ks. He's going to make a difference. Yeah, he's making a big difference. So I'm just not sure they have another game changer here right now. Pat Bailey has been damn good in his first, you know, audition at the big league level. Casey Schmidt has cooled off a lot, but he provides a ton of ability and a ton of security. Sable has been good as the second catcher and like a guy that can hop in the outfield every now and again. So I can appreciate the guys that are stepping up right now, but I just, I have to cap their ceiling at this at six games over 500. So I I hear you on that and I'm with you, but I feel like this is a team, like I said, that could be more aggressive. So Okay, they're not doing the Lorenzen thing. They're not doing the Trevor Williams thing. Could the Giants do the Shane Bieber thing? I don't think so. Do you think they could? I don't know if they would, 
but they could. I think about it from this lens. The Giants want to spend money. They've been trying. Would you trade for Shane Bieber with the intention of extending him? Like a like a Pablo Lopez type situation with the Twins? And give up whatever it takes for that extra year and a half? Then to, you know, extend him from there? I mean, that helps. If, if the Giants had Shane Bieber, they, they, they've got a legit shot yeah. at competing. But he helps them next year, too. And you could potentially extend him. And Kyle Harrison might be coming too. Kyle Harrison could come. I, they'd have to trade some some good pieces. No doubt about it. Luciano. They might have to trade Luciano. I they, maybe they, they have to for Bieber. They, they, yeah, I'd have to look at the, like the whole system. It'd be hard. It'd be hard not to include Luciano. But they could they they could find a way. Maybe let's say they piece it together. You have your guys, your some of your top prospects up now. Matos ain't going anywhere. Schmidt ain't going nowhere. You got Bailey up, and he looks way better than I ever thought he would be. Those are some of your young core pieces. You could feel okay about trading, I think. Like, you wouldn't consider the Giants as a team that could maybe make that monster splash. It's hard, like. Take a quick gander at their system and tell me who jumps out to you that that makes sense for a perfect package. I'm not sure if Bieber is attainable because of the control that he has. Now, Marcus Stroman being a lock to pop out of his player option and with the Cubs struggling the way that they are, I think Stroman could make a lot of sense for San Francisco. Like, I would say they're not in the Bieber sweepstakes. They are in the step under Bieber sweepstakes. But a step above the uh, the other guys that were the, flowing. The like Lorenzen. Lorenzen. <laughs> yeah, Michael Lorenzen well, is on every team in baseball right uh, now. Yeah, he's one of those guys. Well, Jaymont, I think you can see Jordan Montgomery getting moved. Mm-hmm. Um, free agent after this year. Yep. Why would the Cardinals hold on to him the rest of the season if it keeps getting uglier for them? Yep. I know they've looked a little bit better of late. The, it's tough go. with this system. It's tough with this system because you're not moving Kyle Harrison. You'd rather not move Mata or, or Luciano. You're definitely not moving Matos and Schmidt's at the big league level right now. So you'd struggle to piece together a package. You don't want to trade Reggie Crawford, who you just drafted. You could trade Wiz and Hunt, but you're going to need way more than that. So yeah, they're they're in a tough spot. I think they could make a tweener trade. I agree. Um, maybe for an Eduardo Rodriguez for a Jaymont type. That might make more sense. That's going to be more rental type though. But I do think that this team should go for a higher rental. Like the Marlins and like even the Marlins, I don't know if they should give up the kind of prospect that would it would require to get a Jaymont level rental. But I think that the Giants maybe should because I think their system can handle it a bit more. They have a little bit more young talent up there with control. And you know they're going to spend next year too. Depending on what the White Sox do and like I know the White Sox are nine games or 11 games under, but they're also five and a half out of the division right now. Like that's a terrible division. It's this is such a weird year for major league baseball because very weird. The Wests are so good. The AL East is so good. The others are not good. Um, depending on what the White Sox do, I, I think that tweener of the Jaymont cut is Giolito and Lance Giolito West coast kid too. He would love that. I think Giolito would make sense in San Francisco. I think Lance Lynn would make sense in Miami as unfortunate as that sounds. Yeah. But you do not have to give up much at all for Lance Lynn. Yeah. And they could use a vet Giolito to, to the giants, I think makes all the sense in the world and yep. it could almost be an audition. They can decide, you know, Hey, if we like this guy, we can sign him to a two year deal or something like that. For sure. So, yeah. I, I do agree though, that the Giants should be a notch above the other teams in terms of aggression. Uh, but they they shouldn't mortgage the future either because they're going to be in a position maybe next year where they want to make a, a bigger splash and they'll want to be able to. Yep. Um, team that should make the biggest splash here is Arizona. And this is the last one that we wanted to talk about because Arizona is like an add to this where they're not a tweener. They're just objectively good. And yeah, I think they're beating their window by a year, by a lot. They currently have a three and a half game lead in the NL West. They're 43 and 29, man. They're 14 games over 500. Where's the big splash needed on this roster? It's got to be, I mean, uh, starting pitchers. 
dead <laughs> horse, dead horse, dead horse. But this is a team that I think should definitely pay a steep price. Like they, if it's there, I'm not saying do it just to do it, but if it's there, do it. Um, I still don't think they should be in the rental market because so much of their team is controlled. Yeah. And I think that's a good thing, but yeah, go get, go get, Go try to outbid folks. Like you're in a good spot. You don't have to trade Lawler. You don't have to trade Drew Jones. You could trade Davis and Noah Santos, Blake Walston, uh, Blaze Alexander is a pretty good prospect. Either of Alec Thomas, Jake McCarthy, AJ Vukovic has really upped his value. You mean Lynn has really upped his value. Uh, Don Fletcher has upped his value. Yeah, a lot of guys in the system, Can yeah. Zone has upped his value. A lot of guys within this system have upped their value. You can even make the case Bryce Jarvis, former first round pick, has shown some signs of life. So if I were them, I you know, I would I would definitely explore trying to be one of the most aggressive teams on the market. I would also consider a, a DH slash corner masher. I, I do think that there's too many at bats going to Paven Smith, Josh Rojas. I know they've been phenomenal offensively. But that's an area where it might be easier to pick up where everyone's going for pitching. You could go find a, a corner guy that maybe can give you a little bit more than Paven Smith and Josh Rojas right now. Rojas to me is a bench piece. Um, interesting spot. Stowers. Kyle Stowers is an Arizona Diamondback. Does that make much sense? Is Stowers going to be better than Paven Smith, though, offensively? Heston, is Heston Kerstad going to be better than Paven Smith? Obviously. That, they're yeah. not. How are they going to get Heston Kerstad? I don't know. How would they go about it? <laughs> I don't see a way they could humanly <laughs> possibly do that uh, unless they trade him Gallon. Um, I, and I'd say bullpen arm. They, they've gotten a lot from from certain guys. I mean, it's been pretty crazy to see like Scott Mago be an option. Yeah. Like some of the dudes have stepped up. Castro's been solid. Are are you are you making a Bieber package for if you're the Diamondbacks? I don't no. quite think that fits the mold. I don't think that fits the mold either because I think they've ID'd their frontline guy and they've ID'd their two. Like they've got Gallon as their ace. They've got Merrill Kelly as their two. And like it or so not. They're, they're they're tweeners right now then because I, I think it's kind of, you know, you're, you're going to overpay on like a Lorenzen type. I don't I don't like that move for them. Well, for Giolito. Giolito. They're going to have to be one of those. They should definitely be in that market too. Yeah. Um, But this is a team that I would try to pry a controllable arm from somebody if possible, because I do think that they've got, you know, something, something going here for the foreseeable future. I don't know what kind of controllable arms are out there. That's the challenge, but this is a team that I think could definitely do it. And I think if, if you guys are getting frustrated by the conversation going in circles, it's because we're frustrated that the conversation goes. I mean, this is exactly what the deadline's going to be, man. It's not yeah, going to be that good. It's going to be really a, it's a crappy deadline and a frustrating deadline because you're going to be saying like, hey, where are the big guys moving? Where are the haters and the Sotos? Nah, man, that was 2022. That's not this year. I, I'd be shocked. I think this is going to be the way to, for it to be done is big leaguer for big leaguer type, which is yeah. really rare. And that's going to be the the way we see it more this year, not just selling for prospects. So what can some of these teams offer big leaguer for big leaguer wise? Most teams don't want to subtract to add. So it's tough. That's why the Diamondbacks, I think they are in the best spot in the regard that they can trade, you know, one of two underperforming, but big league ready guys in McCarthy and Thomas as yeah. the start of a package that could entice the right team that doesn't want to fully brand itself as a seller but might be looking towards next year. And I think that might make the most sense. So I'm very interested to see how this all plays out because there's going to be a lot of teams figuring things out. I think the best case for the deadline is for a couple of those middling teams to suck over the next month. That's that's the best case for the deadline to get better. Yeah. As for some of the teams that are in between, to stink. And that's the hope. All right, who are we rooting for to suck? Um, do we want? I think we want the Cubs to get out of contention. Cubs fall out of contention. I'm kind of in on the Guardians just just falling apart. Like it's it's too, they're too frustrating of a watch for me at this point. Yep. Um, Red Sox just because I just don't see how they could feasibly get that division. No. And I don't see how they even pass any of the the teams ahead of them. So they're gonna have to sell off some pieces. But they probably think they're in it right now. Cardinals just put them out of their misery. Take them yeah. out back. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
And then I'm not going to root against the Mariners. They're fun. They, they've been too, too much fun to watch this year. Uh, and the Padres will never sell. So that, that's probably about it. Pirates. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Pirates are fun, but like need more clarity in this. I, I, I want them to sell. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't mind the Pirates kind of letting off some steam too. We're just dealing with the burden of bad divisions. I want Minnesota to go on this crazy hot stretch. Like- that would also help. Minnesota going on a hot streak would definitely help to make teams more sellers. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that that could open up the floodgates for Cleveland. That could open, like that could provide closure. Like, Hey, we're going to move Beaver for the best available package. Detroit opens up some of their assets. Chicago opens up some of their assets. Kansas city is going to move whatever people, you know, ideas as valuable that, that aren't Bobby Witt or Melendez Vinny's out, but like, yeah, it, it's tough, man. Like, I'm just rooting for Minnesota to get really good. And I'm rooting for the Cubs and Cardinals to fall out of contention. Yeah. So I'm in. Ah, all right. Let's root for some shitty baseball, everybody. Uh, again, just baseball show presented by bet MGM. You're headed to London town to go watch Cubs Cardinals. Yes, I am. Hopefully, well, I guess somebody has to lose in those games. So <laughs> hopefully one of them loses them all. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Um, let's root for the Cubs to lose both. Right. Cause the Cardinals are four and a half back of the Cubs. Yeah, let's do it. I love it, man. All right, uh, you and Peter going to talk to folks tomorrow? Yeah, we'll try. We'll see how my – I think I think we should be fine. I think we should be fine. Yeah. Cool beans. All right, we'll talk to you guys tomorrow.